it doesn't have to be complicated. You can make a really good meal with just salt, pepper, and olive oil. You don't need a ton of spices and make this marinade and do this in advance and all this stuff. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 188 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I hope that you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyoutsuka.com. You know my purpose, it is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. And in the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one, not one, that wasn't truly brilliant at something. So for all of these reasons, I am just delighted to introduce you to Rebecca Eisenberg. Rebecca is a food blogger and trained pastry chef. She fell in love with food and baking as a hobby while working as a journalist and editor at places like Upworthy, Headspace, and Medium. And then parlayed that love into her work as a food editor at Greatest. In 2019, she started her blog, thepracticalkitchen.com, as a hobby when she began freelancing. Today, The Practical Kitchen is her full-time job where she shares creative recipes for practically-minded people, as well as kitchen shopping guides and technique explainers always writing with neurodivergent brains in mind. Rebecca also brings an anti-diet, fat-positive perspective to her food writing, making the practical kitchen a space free from diet talk. Woohoo! In 2020, she went to pastry school and in true ADHD fashion, graduated as valedictorian of her class in the middle of a pandemic. A Pittsburgh native, Rebecca currently lives in Boston, with her husband, who also has ADHD, and their two cats, Bones and Clementine. Welcome, Rebecca. Did I get all of that right? Yes, you did. I was trying to remember what I wrote in my own bio, and you (laughs) nailed all of it. It was all there. (laughs) Wonderful. So I should also mention that you are here courtesy of one of our listeners, Justine Bunger, who kept telling me, Actually, she didn't keep telling me. Your name came up a few times, and then Justine was the one who I finally said, okay, we need to talk to Rebecca. Go, fi- Let's go find her. So wow. I'm delighted to have you here. That's great to know. Thank you. And thank you, Justine. <laughs> so can we talk about your ADHD diagnoses first? Yeah. What yeah. happened? So I am the only woman with ADHD I know who was diagnosed as a child. I was diagnosed, and I actually don't know the full circumstances of my diagnosis, but I know I started medication in about sixth grade after my parents had sort of exhausted non-medication interventions. I was a fairly oblivious child, so like at some point in like fourth or fifth grade, I think we started going to, like my mom started taking me to therapy, you know, and it was all the kind of kid therapy, playing with stuff 
talk, you know, drawing stuff. Um, and I remember they were trying, we had checklists, we were color coding books and notebooks just to kind of see, but I, I didn't understand why any of this was happening. I think I probably just assumed everyone my age was doing it. <sighs> but what I learned later was, I guess the re- we were on a road trip. It was me, my mom, my dad, and my sister. I, so I would have been in third grade when I was learning the times tables. And they were quizzing me for a test or something on the times tables. And in this two-hour car ride, I could not remember anything you know like I just couldn't numbers mean very little to me they always have and I could not remember the times tables my younger sister who was in kindergarten was memorizing them and my parents Mm. were like hmm something here doesn't add up you know so I had always been very hyper and things like that but there was something about the times tables where I wasn't catching on and my younger sister was that they were like, we need to seek out actual help. So I know they exhausted sort of non-medication stuff. And in sixth grade, in the middle of the school year, I started taking medication. And I think my mom has saved somewhere my report cards from the first two semesters. It was sort of like straight B's with like A's in like art and English. And then the comments from the teachers all said like, Rebecca could do really well in this class if she could just pay attention. And then if you look at the first report card after I started the meds, I had all A's except for like a B in math. And all of the things said, like, we knew Rebecca could do it if she just paid attention. (laughs) Um, (laughs) My parents didn't tell my teachers that I had ADD and they didn't even, my mom debates this with me. I don't remember being told that I had ADD. I remember her explaining the medication as some people have a pathway in their brain that is blocked that helps them remember to do things or pay attention. Mm -hmm. This medication will open that pathway. So, and again, I was an oblivious, I I just didn't question it. I was like, okay, I take these meds now. That's what I do. And it was in ninth grade at my grandfather's funeral, which happened around midterms that I overheard my mom saying to someone, how am I going to explain to her school that her grandfather died and she has ADD and that's why we need her to take her midterms at a different time. And I remember Mm. turning around and going, I have ADD. Did you know what it was? I knew what it was from the like media, like the way, you know, Mm. anyone who doesn't have ADD knows what it is, but that was my understanding. And I remember my mom being like, yes, of course you do. How did you not know that? (laughs) And I was like, I, I don't know. I didn't know. The way I think of it is I am both very grateful that my parents got me help as early as they did. Because in the early 2000s, late 90s, girls were not diagnosed with ADD the way I was. And I am so grateful that like I had the medication when I did and some of that support. However, all of the research was sort of done on boys with ADD. And at no point did anyone that I can remember ever really sit me down and say, this is what ADD is. This is how ADD might change as you get older. And at the time when I was diagnosed and when I was learning about it, there was still that sort of belief that you grow out of it. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, it it was great that I was prepared for it. But in other ways, no one really prepared prepared me for how the ADD might change over time, coping mechanisms other skills you might have to build. It was just sort of like the medication worked. She's good. And so I had to do a lot of learning again as an adult. Well, and honestly, Rebecca, I think that's basically what it is today too. Mm -hmm. You know, doctors just write you a prescription and they don't really, you know, that's it. That's what you walk Mm -hmm. out the door with. And I mean, if medication works for you, oh my God, that is so wonderful. But it can't be just about medication. And what's Mm -hmm. interesting to me is, you had bees in school, so you weren't doing poorly. Mm-hmm. But your parents must have seen that, yeah, but she could do so much. We know she's capable of so much more. Yeah, I mean, I was smart. I am smart. Like, I mean, you know, so many people with ADHD are really smart and capable and brilliant, but just don't necessarily know how to focus or study or stay on top of things in a school environment. I went to a small private school, which was really helpful because I got the attention from teachers that I needed. And there were a lot of things at school that I was naturally good at. Like, I, I mean, I'm a smart 
person. But it was always more like my grades didn't really reflect my actual capabilities or intellectual capabilities. They were more reflective of like my ability to pay attention in class or remember to bring the right homework home. As a child, it was interesting. I was very nerdy. I wasn't one of the cool kids. I had glasses. And so there was always this assumption from my classmates that I was very smart and that I got good grades. Mm. And I I kept it very sort of hush hush. I, I played very coy. You know, there were always the students mm. who were really competitive about grades and they wanted to see what you got. And I always sort of would like hide my paper, like, I don't know, maybe I got an A, who knows? And I like had really <laughs> gotten a D and I just let them believe it was an A. Yeah. You know, school just, school and studying just were not skills that I really had. And, and I just was like, I'm just going to do my best. And if I do well, I do well. And if I don't, I don't. But I, yeah, I mean, I did pretty well. I, I am a people pleaser. I wanted to be good at these things. But it was really, I mean, taking tests was really hard. Studying was really hard, you know, and it was with the medication I was able to to then do those things. And do you remember it becoming so much easier once you got on those meds? Or did you feel like you still had to work so hard? I mean, this is the weird thing about sort of having however many years I had of not, not knowing what the meds were doing is I, I don't think I really, real like, I don't think I really realized. It wasn't more until I was an adult that I, I could really feel the difference. I don't remember much as a kid. I mean, it's hard because as a kid, you're just like, you're pure kind of in the moment. Like, yeah. you know, it was just, I take the meds. I don't really think about what they're doing. It was really much more about what my parents were observing in me than what I was feeling in myself. So if I came home from school, you know, when I think when you're a kid, they'll do sort of like the long term meds, and then you get home and you take a short term one so you can do your homework. Yeah, I would always forget, of course, to take the short term one. And so it was it was more about like what my parents were observing. They're like, Oh, you're tapping your feet. Oh, you're doing this tick. Oh, you're, you know, running around instead of doing your homework. And then they would prompt me to take my med. There wasn't that sort of internal thing that I have as an adult that's like, oh, God, I need to take my meds so that I can actually get some work done today. As a kid, I was like, whatever. If I get it done, I get it done, (laughs) you know. So was the only problem in school? What were you like outside of school? It sounds like you were not a problem to your parents. No. Well, okay. So in school, I'm (laughs) I'm an introvert and I'm very shy. So I was very quiet in school. In school, it was not um, what you think of as someone with ADD bouncing off the walls. I would tap my feet sometimes and that, that annoyed people. At home is where I was bouncing off the walls. I very much had the hyperactivity. And when I go back and watch home movies, like there's some home movies, I think my sister's three, I'm maybe five or six. And there's just a litany of like, whoever's holding the camera is just going, Rebecca, back off. Rebecca, it's Hannah's turn to be on camera. Rebecca, move out of the way. Rebecca, Hannah's in front of the camera right now. Rebecca, stop running around. Rebecca, did you just knock that over? Like, (laughs) it was when the adrenaline kicked in and that hyperactivity kicked in, I could Mm. not calm myself down. So I I was at home. I, I don't think I caused problems for them, but it was definitely once I got going on something, it was very hard for me to stop or to control my impulses. Okay. So how was high school? You talked about junior high, you Mm -hmm. started taking medication, your grades got so much better. And then did that continue on in high school? And yeah, in high school? Yeah, high school, I did pretty well. My high school had sort of a tiered, like there were mainstream classes, then there was like a middle tier, and then there was like the advanced classes. And usually people sort of were in one track or the other. And I managed to get into the advanced track kind of by the skin of my teeth based on like grades and stuff. And I think they maybe had you do an IQ test. I can't remember. But I was able to take certain classes like math or science in some of the lower tiers. Mm -hmm. So that actually worked very well for me where I was able to take the advanced classes and the things that I was interested in. And then the things I wasn't as interested in were a little more like basic. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, high school, in high school, I, because, well, it was ninth grade is when I I learned I had ADD. And I kind of prided myself on 
you know, every now and then someone would say something like, oh, ADD doesn't exist. And I prided myself on being like, it does. And I have it because I knew that people would be surprised to hear that I had it. I love that. And I liked kind of normalizing this idea that it didn't look like maybe what you thought it looked like. But I also didn't really know what it looked like either. I just knew I didn't look like what people thought of. And so Mm -hmm. I, I leaned into that. And then my senior year of high school in my English class, and I had the most amazing English teacher who I think also had ADD. Mm. She was so wonderful. And we had to write a research paper. And I usually waited until the last possible minute to do any writing um, for anything. But she would sign um, permission slips for me for study hall to go work in the computer lab. And I decided to write my paper on the silver linings of having ADHD. And I would go work every day in the computer lab during my study hall period, thanks to her writing that permission slip. And I wrote like, I'm still so, so proud of this, this paper. I think I got the highest grade in the class Mm. for it, which like I was super proud of. But in doing that research paper, I went into it thinking, oh, I have like kind of mild ADD. And then I started doing the research and reading these books about it and was like, oh, my God, I have like full on ADHD, all this stuff that I thought everyone's brains worked this way. It turns out they don't. You know, there were things in some of the books that were like for parents with kids with ADHD. It was like, these are things you can do to help your kid. And I was like, I learned to do that on my own. I didn't realize that was like an Mm -hmm. ADD thing. That was just something I like figured out. And it, I like really spiraled. And I, I went to my mom and I asked her if I could go to therapy because I was like, I need to figure out like what is going on in my brain because I didn't know that all of this stuff that I, the way I think, I didn't know that it was part of the ADD. And so when, she, you're, I mean, mm-hmm. when you're talking about all this stuff, can you be more specific? Are you talking about yeah, the let emotion me... part or... It wasn't the emotion part so much because I, I, that I kind of only learned about more recently. It was more that I think I had had a very flat idea of what ADHD was. I thought of it as the hyperactivity and the sort of scatterbrainedness, the like leaving my wallet places or not being able to find stuff. I didn't think of it as, you know, how quickly my brain worked or why I was drawn to certain environments or certain tasks or the hyper focus nature of it. Like Mm. I had, I, I am a speed reader. And when I read, I get so lost in a book that like, I could not tell you what is going on around me. Like all I can, if I think back on what was happening while I'm reading, all I can see in my mind is the page of the book. And I didn't know that that was an ADHD thing. I thought everyone worked that way. My friends who procrastinated on papers, I thought they were doing the same thing I was. And they weren't. They were just normal procrastinating. Mm -hmm. So there were just a lot of things that I I didn't know. And the one thing I remember specifically was like, I mean, I very much over identified with like certain characters in media, you know, like, I'm like, I'm a Hermione, I'm just like Mark from Rent, whatever. And a lot of times when I was struggling to do something that I knew I had to do, make a phone call, run an errand, the way I could get myself to do it was by being like, how would this character do it? Do what they would do. Because I needed like a, a script or a for someone to break down this otherwise normal task into something followable. And that advice came up in a number of these books. And I was like, I thought that was something weird that like I just did. And now I'm learning like that's a a way that parents can teach their kids how to do hard things that feel overwhelming. So there were just these things that I, I just hadn't necessarily associated with ADHD or hadn't thought about how other people's brains work. I, have a, I had a friend in high school who was very smart, very organized and precise and scientific about stuff. 
And I remember her being her having a conversation with her at one point where she was like, oh, well, why don't you just store that information in your brain where you store this information? And I was like, I don't understand what you're talking about. What do you mean you store stuff in your brain in a specific place? <laughs> My brain is just a whirling dervish of chaos. And if I can pull the correct information from it when I need to, I consider myself lucky. And she was like, no, I have like a filing cabinet. In Wait, my brain. in her brain? Yeah. And I was like, oh, people's brains work in real different ways. Like, <laughs> I, I need to learn how to like work with mine. So there were just things that I just, I just assumed everyone's brains worked like that. And in learning that they didn't, I was like, oh boy, like there is more to this ADD thing than I think. But I always saw it still as sort of a, a superpower and something I, I liked about myself in high school. So what happened after high school? College was fine. I mean, it, it was it was definitely a bit of a learning curve, you know, uh, controlling my schedules and stuff like that. Like I remember at one point I had to hang a, a, a post-it note next to the door of my dorm room that was like to leave for classes that start at 9.05, leave no later than it was like 8.45 or something. Because yeah. for some reason I could get everywhere I needed to on time for whenever classes started, except for the 9.05 classes my like time blindness always threw me off. And I would have to like sort of write these reminders down somewhere where I would see them. Otherwise, every day I would forget what time I had to leave. And isn't that insane? Like, you know what time you need to yeah. leave. You've done it every day for how many months? And you still can't remember. Like, I think, you know, sometimes my husband looks at me like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but I literally can't remember. I just get confused. Yeah. So, so I you, mean, mm -hmm. you didn't have that first year typical ADHD experience where you just struggled because not only did you have to do your school, but you had to get yourself fed. You had to get your laundry done, you know, blah, 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 in bed in time to get um, up in the morning. I did have, I had some of that, I would say, but it, it was more, I was overwhelmed by some of the expectations in my classes. And I, the thing I struggled with most in college, I would say, is I didn't know how to ask for help when I mm. needed it. Um, I went to Penn State. It's a huge state school. And like I said, I was very shy and very introverted. And I always, I was sort of raised with this, like, you have to figure out how to do things sort of attitude. And so I didn't really understand like it, it always felt like if you get sent to the principal's office, if you have to talk to a guidance counselor, like that was a bad thing in high school, right? Like you didn't want to have to talk to the administrators. And so in college, I didn't really understand like how to take advantage of like your guidance counselors or, you know, the sort of supports that the school provides. And I, I was just kind of, you know, going into it with the attitude that I, I kind of have with everything, which is just like, just do it and it'll work out. Just do what you can. It'll work out. So in retrospect, I, retrospect, I wish I had learned more how to ask for help when I needed it. Because I, I did struggle with, with some things. And I think I just assumed they were hard because they were supposed to be hard. They're hard and for think, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. For example, there was a, you had to take like English 30. And I, whatever English 30 class I ended up in, ended up being a technical writing class, which is like how to write manuals mm. for things. And it was the most boring kind of writing. And I just thought it's hard for everyone. I hate this class. I thought I liked English and like writing classes. And this is miserable and I hate it. And I just thought it's supposed to be that way. And then I learned from other people who took English 30 that their English 30 was a creative writing class or their English 30 was a poetry class or, you know, and so I just, I wish that I had known at the time that there was probably someone I could have gone to, to say, Hey, this doesn't feel right for me. Is there another option? You know? And I just didn't know that I probably could have done that. And that class, I mean, that class caused me so much anxiety. And I ended up in college, I, I think I, I was on twice as high a dose of my medication as I'm on now, mm. you know, and I, I think it, it helped me a lot. But I also think, you know, in a really high dose for a long period of time, it can cause anxiety. 
so it, it's stuff that I realized more in retrospect than than I realized in the moment. You know, I went to college, I met my husband there, like I had a great time in college, but you know, I could have used more help, but it just uh I'm trying to think of how to say this. It turned out okay though. Yeah, it did turn out okay. Yeah, it was I, I realized it more in in retrospect that there were times in my life where I I needed help where I wasn't getting it and I didn't mm-hmm. know how to ask for it. So college was fine. You know, I have my degrees in film and video. I liked those classes a lot. I worked for my college humor magazine. I was editor in chief my senior year. You know, I really found things that I was passionate about and that I liked and that worked really well for me in college. I think your story is interesting because it's been by and large quite positive. Mm-hmm. But I think the reason it's been it was so positive is because of the fact that you were doing something that you were really interested in. So mm-hmm. I'm curious what would have happened if, like me, you would have decided, oh, my dad's a dentist. I'm going to mm-hmm. go to dental school, right? And so you're doing work. So you've got this whole college experience that can be troubling anyway or can be difficult for us anyway. But then you're also doing work that you're not good at. And yeah. You can't figure out, like, why am I studying all these hours and I still suck at this? Well, because you have no interest in it. So I think your story is so interesting because you still love writing. You're just mm-hmm. naturally good at writing. So mm-hmm. it makes sense to me that, um, by and large, it was quite positive. Yeah, I mean, it, it generally it was. And my parents were always great at encouraging me to lean into my strengths and yeah. into the things that that made me passionate and that I was interested in helped me get some of my jobs out of college. And I was able to find these things that were really fulfilling and that built skills. But in other ways, I came out of there without some of the skills I needed to pursue other jobs that I wanted, if that makes sense. And I just didn't know that at the time. It does. However, Rebecca, I think your timing, especially given what you do, Mm. was positively brilliant. Because if there were skills that I wish I had, I'd say film and video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's been so useful now in this like era of content creation. (laughs) Exactly. Okay. So let's move over to what it is that you do. So I opened your website, Mm -hmm. I stalked your Instagram, Mm -hmm. and I immediately felt a kinship to what you're doing. You know, when my kids were little, I was you. There were so many Mm -hmm. parties, so many birthdays, holidays. I just loved food. I loved entertaining. I loved baking. And I was really good at it. And I'm Mm -hmm. sure that there are listeners who, this is so not their thing, so they're thinking we're (laughs) both not so. But what I really wanted to say is that having something taste good is great, but it's only half the equation. It can taste great. But if it looks like something, I don't know, your four-year-old and your dog made <laughs> in their own bodily fluids, you know, I'm sorry, it <laughs> ends up tasting that way regardless. You need aesthetics. And you, my friend, have this in spades. Oh, my gosh. Everything yeah. you do is so beautiful, from your food, of course, to your website, to your photos. You're definitely a creative. You have an amazing eye, you know, just fantastic aesthetics. And now that you tell me, oh, and then I also majored in film and video, <laughs> it all makes sense. So I just I just want to take my hat off to you for how beautiful, like just everything you create is so incredibly beautiful. So I see why you're successful at it. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So I want to know what made you start The Practical Kitchen? Why'd you do it? Yeah. So I, so the thing is I, my husband and I have been cooking together for a while. Like I, I, when I was working from home, I kind of fell in love with cooking as a hobby because it, baking in particular, cause you can start the dough in the morning. It rises throughout the day, you know, a couple times throughout the day, I'd have to stand up and do something with it, which was great. Cause it got me away from my computer. And then at the end of the day, I'd have like a great loaf of bread. Oh, and so it smells I, so good. I know. (laughs) So I had like fallen in love with cooking and baking and we watched a ton of like food network, food shows. Uh I love a food project. And when I was working at Headspace, which was in a physical office, I finally had an office where I could bring in the stuff that I was making. 
and everyone always said, you know, when you're in the world of content creation, I was a journalist, digital content kind of thing, and you're good at food, everyone's going, you should start a food blog, you should start a food blog. And I'm like, okay, but I'm following other people's recipes. If I start a food blog, I, I need to develop recipes. That's a whole different end science. And so I kind of, you know, I, I would kind of laugh it off and be like, ha ha ha, very, you know, very funny, but I'm not going to do it. And then it was when I left Headspace and I started freelancing that a lot of my freelance work, you know, it paid the bills, but it was copy editing. It's like punctuation, mm -hmm. spelling. It wasn't as creatively fulfilling, although it was better than being burnt out in a full-time job. And so I was like, you know what? I think what I want to do is combine my love of food with this, you know, sort of almost decade of experience in digital content. And I think I want to start applying for some food editor jobs, food media jobs, but I don't have a portfolio. And I don't even know if that's something that I, I want to, to take a hobby and make it my work. Mm -hmm. So I talked to a friend of mine who has a couple of blogs, and he kind of explained to me how you get them started, what the process is like for monetizing them if you want to do that. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do it. Like, let's just start it. Well, that's what, what that's your that's your motto, right? You'll yeah. figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I and I literally like I should have done like maybe ten more minutes of research and like double check <laughs> that like my Twitter handle could handle the name of the URL, whatever. But I was just like, I just need to do it, and then I will figure it out. But if I keep thinking about it, I'm just going to put it off forever. So I just set it up, and I just started putting stuff up. I started, I you know, I was like, I'm just going to feel it out. I'm going to figure out what my voice is. I'm going to figure out recipe development. I'm going to see how long I can keep it going. And if it grows enough that I can monetize it, great. I'll have another source of income as I'm freelancing. And it turned out I loved it. It turned out I had so much more to learn than I thought I did. <laughs> but I, I loved it. And then I got really lucky. I started it in, I think, like July or August 2019. And then I shouldn't say I got lucky, but the pandemic was great for food bloggers. Those early days of yeah. the pandemic when everyone was at home. Yes. Oh, my God. We were cooking up a storm <laughs> over here because there was nothing else to do. Totally. And I had two posts about sourdough that mm. both took off and, and took my blog from being like a little bit of a hobby into a like, oh, this could this could really make some money if I if I keep doing this right. Yeah. And then there was sort of a post pandemic dip and I had to do a bunch of work to, to kind of get things back. But, you know, I'm someone who needs sort of instant validation is the wrong word. But like I worked really well in like breaking news when it was like this thing happened. You need a story. It needs to be published now. How did the story perform? I work less well when it's like we're publishing a thing three months from now, we need a marketing campaign that will continue on for six oh my months. Gosh. Well, you're ADHD. Yeah. Exactly. So having my own food blog where I could just publish it, look at the data, see how it was doing, write the next thing, keep going, was really good. And then the fact that I sort of got that sudden upswing of traffic and was able to kind of build an audience and keep getting that immediate engagement and, and interaction and, you know, build a community around it was, you know, kept me, kept me going. I, you know, with anyone with ADHD, when you start something new, you're always like, well, we'll see how long this lasts. And this has just kept going because it works. I mean, I love it so much. And I love the, the community that I've built and the people who engage with my recipes. It's so rewarding to see people making them, to see people trying things they never thought they could try and to do them and to do them well. It just, it really keeps me going. And it's been really cool to see this thing that started out as like, oh, well, maybe I'll have a portfolio as I apply for jobs become my full-time job. Got it. So, you know, a few minutes ago, I said that, you know, food and entertaining, that was my thing. I mm -hmm. loved it. It just, you know, everything that was creative about me, and then just, you know, being able to be around people as far as the entertaining part and, you know, all the little kids running around. So my thing. But something happened to my brain. Mm -hmm. You know, it got so much worse. And since then, 
I just kind of have lost interest. And I always struggle to follow a recipe like who the Mm -hmm. hell develops those things where there is so much text, no pictures, no space, the Mm -hmm. fonts are, you know, so small, you need a magnifying glass. And then what I also struggled with was, and I always did, was the timing and what Mm -hmm. comes out when. But now it's almost like, I, you know, I, I feel like, okay, it was like my brain going sideways where <laughs> I somehow had enough intuition about these things that I, I could fix things. And so everything worked out versus now, mm-hmm. like I literally will forget that I'm cooking. So simple things. Mm-hmm. I mean, I used to cook out of the French Laundry cookbook. <laughs> and now I'm just trying to make sure that toast doesn't burn. Mm-hmm. You know, just it is such a struggle. And so I think what's happened is I just don't care anymore because, mm-hmm. it, you know, and granted, my creativity is is moving, you know, has moved to other areas, mm-hmm. but it kind of makes me sad. And so I, you know, have often thought, oh, well, I should take cookbooks and I should Make them for, you know, ADHD brains, Mm -hmm. you know, where there's lots of pictures and there's Mm -hmm. lots of space. Like, I love the, I don't know if you've ever, you probably haven't, but subscribe to Blue Apron where everything's hard and there's Mm -hmm. photos and there's just a little lines of type. So, Mm -hmm. oh, what needs to go next? And I'm not constantly trying to, you know, weave my way through all of this text. So Mm -hmm. my long-winded question is, do you have any suggestions for how to manage our ADHD in the kitchen? Because I'm telling you, 20 years ago, I would have been like, well, what's the big deal? Yeah, these things are a little bit of a problem versus today. It's like, it sucks. And so I don't even want to do it. Yes, this is something I think about a lot, especially when I'm writing my recipes. I try to include a lot of visuals in the blog post above the recipe. I know people say they like to skip past that, but like I include that stuff there because I'm thinking of people who are neurodivergent, who need visuals, who need to really understand what they're doing, who want something quick to glance at. Um, And I try to keep my recipes brief, but also include enough detail so that people aren't confused by unfamiliar terms. And when people ask my advice for how to motivate themselves to cook, I try to be aware of the fact that the things that work for me because I love cooking and baking may not work for someone who's just like so over it. Because if you're not interested in it, like your ADHD will fight you every step of the way. But I mean, if it helps in any way, like there are some things about ADHD that are universal because my ADHD gets the better of me sometimes too. I have exploded eggs on the stove that I forgot I was boiling and the water boiled away and I was picking eggshell out of the ceiling for months. Like it does happen. But some things that I find that are really helpful are um, I use my Alexa device all the time because without having to stop what I'm doing, I can just out loud say to her, set a timer for 20 minutes, an hour, remind me to do this in an hour and a half, remind me that I left the meat defrosting. I can just say these things. And then wherever I am in the house, it will remind me and I'll go, Oh, right. I forgot I was doing that. I need to go. Okay. So hold on a second. Mm -hmm. So I use my Apple watch for that, but it's kind of a pain. And then sometimes I forget Mm -hmm. what it was for, you know, the timer. Versus with the Alexa, you can actually say, you know, bread rising or bread, you know, in the oven and it will tell you. Yes. And I I have used it. There are times when there are so many reminders on Alexa that I don't know how she's keeping them straight because sometimes I'm doing four batches of dough and each one is 15 minutes behind the next one. And I just label the bowl that the dough is in because, you know, I need to remember which one is which. And I'll just say, Alexa, remind me to you know, whatever, deflate dough one in an hour. Alexa, remind me to deflate dough two in an hour and 15 minutes. Alexa, remind me to deflate dough three. And she will say, like, she'll, the alert will go off. And it's not just the timer. It's Rebecca, remember dough three, Rebecca, dough four. Like she will repeat back to you what you told her you need to remember, which is much more useful than the timer situation. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I have one in the kitchen area, but because I had my Apple watch, I never thought of it, but I, I love that idea actually. And I love that you can also see it visually then, right? Yes. Yeah. I always recommend to people, if you have ADHD and you're using something in the kitchen, get the Echo device that has the um, screen on it. Yep. I um, agree. 
I use it for math all the time too, when I need to divide dough and like, I have auditory processing. Like if you just say something to me, I have trouble remembering it and it's numbers. So the wait, fact wait, wait, that wait, I- hold on a second. Mm-hmm. You can use, I'm going to say A-L-E-X-A because you've woken her up. And so now she's, oh, you know, <laughs> she, she's eavesdropping. So you are telling me that you can use this for like all of the fractions and stuff in recipes? A lot of them. Yeah. You can ask her, I'll ask her like, Alexa, how many grams of water are in a cup? Or Alexa, oh what, what percent of a hundred is 50? I mean, I know that's 50%, but anytime yeah. I'm doing stuff like that, she's not always perfect on it. So like if something sounds off, it's good to double check. Mm-hmm. But I will ask her like, Alexa, what's 856 divided by eight? She'll say it out loud. I won't register it, but I can look over at the screen and the math equation is sitting right there. And I'm like, oh, okay, it's a hundred and whatever. Oh my God, um, that is brilliant. I love yeah. that. Definitely okay. get one of the ones with the screen. <laughs> yep. I'm going to yeah. actually take mine and move it. Actually, you know what? I'm going to get a second one because this one I like on my desk, but I'm mm-hmm. going to get one and move it into the kitchen. I think that is just wonderful advice. Yeah. It, it makes things so much easier. And then the other thing is, at least when my husband and I first started cooking, I subscribed to a couple cooking magazines because it meant that every month or every two months, I would get sort of a new delivery of recipes. Yep. And that was always really exciting to find something new. And what we would do is we have two binders and we would go through the magazine and tear out any recipes we wanted to try, put them into one binder. And then if we tried them and we liked them, we'd move them into the second binder. And it created this kind of fun project of like, you wanted to be able to move stuff into your second binder. And so it kept us kind of going with this like, let's try something new this week. Let's do this because it wasn't so much about the reward of the food itself, although that obviously is is part of it. Mm. It was also about the, and then we get to move, you know, you either get to like crumble it into a ball and chuck it in the garbage because you hated the recipe, or you're getting to move it into this new binder. And now we have a binder of things we want to try. And we have a great binder of recipes that we love. That's like our own curated cookbook. Wow. Uh, I think... uh... You make me think because I realize, like you, I used to get all of these magazine subscriptions. And so Mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Did Mm -hmm. I stop ordering the magazines? And that's what's, you know, why I no longer really cook that much. Mm -hmm. And I don't really care to cook that much unless it's for company. Or is it that I don't have the interest? And so that's Mm -hmm. why I don't order the magazine. I have behind me sitting right here at my desk, I've got 15 binders full of recipes. Oh, wow. (laughs) Which I feel like, oh my gosh, I need to go through those now and do what you just said, put them into one binder of my Mm -hmm. absolute favorites. Because I always think about what if something happens to me and my kids will want to make something that they remember, you know, I I always made. And I mean, it's such a mess, 15 Mm -hmm. binders, like where would they even go? And I would say 90% of what's in there, I probably don't even care about. Yeah. And it's, I I find it really motivating. I mean, ADHD, we all have a tendency to kind of hoard stuff. We like hang on to things just in case. To get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. One day I might need this. Right. But by going through the magazines and tearing stuff out, Mm -hmm. then I'm like, cool, I can throw out this magazine. I've just kept the things that I need, throw out the magazine, recycle the magazine. But it's, it's an interesting, different way of motivating yourself to cook because the reward isn't just, oh, and then I'm eating this delicious meal. It's also, and I'm building this, you know, sort of collection of recipes that the next time I'm like, what do I want to make for dinner? Yeah. You can just open that and they're there. And it makes it so much easier then, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think what we struggle with is, are those decisions, Mm -hmm. you know, oh my gosh, one more thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's why I really turn to meal planning because otherwise you get to the end of your workday and it's time to cook dinner. And I'm like, I don't want to open a cookbook. But if I planned on Sunday that I was going to be making this thing on Wednesday, at the end of the day on Wednesday, I just have to do the next step, which is open the cookbook and go to the right page. And then I can start cooking. Okay. So that, I guess, gets us to meal planning. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just going to warn you, I cannot decide Mm -hmm. what I want to eat until I'm actually hungry. Mm -hmm. which has been a contention, you know, my, my husband Mm -hmm. is the absolute opposite. He would Uh plan the week in advance, they plan Uh the month in advance and be perfectly happy. So Mm -hmm. meal planning, like, yeah, what the hell? Really? So 
Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like I said, my husband and I, before we started cooking a lot, we had sort of like four recipes that we would make. It was like burritos, spaghetti, yeah. stir fry, and like hamburgers. Like that was it. And we were getting really bored of that. Did you even use a recipe or was it just whatever you had you throw in there? We, it was a little bit of both. A little bit of both, I would say. Or it was like we were just going to order takeout. But we were like, you know what? Like we're watching all these cooking shows. I bet we could do some of this stuff. And we were getting bored. I think I just said this. We were getting bored with those recipes. So that was when we picked up like a $5 cookbook at a used bookstore. And I subscribed to some of these cooking magazines. And we started by planning one new recipe every night. Don't do that. That's that a lot. Too many new recipes. And you're going to end up with a ton of stuff that you don't use up, don't need. Now, the way we meal plan, I mean, there's always one day of the week that's a question mark. There's always at least one day of the week that's leftovers. And then what we do is, you know, we sort of plan it out like, okay, Monday is tacos, Tuesday is stir fry, Wednesday is leftovers, Thursday is our question mark, Friday will be, you know, pizza. And um, is that the same every every week? No, or? no, no, no. Every Sunday we sit down and oh plan it. And we do our grocery shopping together all at once. On Sundays um, too? On Sundays too. What we do is we start with what we have in the house. So some weeks are like, how many of the things in the pantry can we use up this week? And then we start with recipes around those things to kind of minimize the new stuff coming in. Sometimes it's what's in the freezer that we want to do, that we want to use up. Sometimes it's, oh, we have these leftovers from like Saturday. How can we use those this week? Because otherwise your pantry just becomes kind of a void of things you forgot you had. And then you're going to end up with like three tubs of, you know, spaghetti sauce because you forgot you already had it and you're going to keep buying it. Yep. So we always try to kind of start with things we already have. We, we go like, what are we in the mood for? And then we purposely leave that question mark day and the leftovers day. Because if we do get to the end of the day and we're like, I'm really not feeling like tacos tonight. We'll just pick something from later in the week and do that instead. But because we buy all of our groceries on Sunday at the same time, we know we have the stuff to make Friday's dinner on Monday if we want to. So how long does it take to plan? And then how long does it take each night to actually cook? Planning, I would say, is like maybe 20 or 30 minutes. We do it kind of casually. Like, you know, it's right kind of when we wake up, we're like probably watching TV, eating breakfast. We like pull out a couple cookbooks. We'll pull out the binder. Or, you know, one of us will just go stand in the pantry and start shouting to the other one, like, we have three things of tomatoes. We have too many boxes of rigatoni pasta. What can we do with rigatoni pasta? And from there, we just go, oh, you know what we haven't made for a while? We haven't made this. Or sometimes it's because I'm recipe testing and it's like, oh, I really wanted to recipe test this this week. Like, let's do that for dinner. So we try not to have it take too long, but we're usually kind of multitasking and still kind of getting our day going. So it's not like we sit down and like, you know, are like, we need to do this. Like, let's take it seriously. We have fun doing it. And it's fun coming up with recipes and thinking about what we're going to eat. And if there's a week where we know we're really busy or where we know we're not going to be in the mood to cook, we plan, you know, like, let's do box mac and cheese with chicken breast. You know, we do things that are easier that rely on more pre-made like let's pick up a rotisserie chicken and use that in a bunch of stuff so we try not to have that part take too long but it can kind of get interrupted we both have ADD so it's like we'll plan Monday and Tuesday get distracted by something else come back and finish Wednesday Thursday Friday and then the cooking itself is like anywhere from I don't know 20 minutes to an hour it really depends on how complicated the recipe is my husband, I would say, does most of our regular weeknight cooking. He's a very, very good cook. So he does more of that. And then I do more of the like sous chef kind of stuff, I would say, mm -hmm. and the like organizing of the stuff. But we we kind of take turns sometimes with dinner as well. And it just depends. Like I'm much more of a, if I can skip a step or make something faster or whatever, I'm like, yes, yes, going to do that. He's much more he wants to do it right. And he's going to take the extra step. And he's gonna, he's a little bit of a, a fussier, like more of a perfectionist cook. I'm more like, it's chopped, it's good enough. Like, let's get it in the pan. He's like, I want the onion pieces to be the same size. 
we have different things that, <laughs> that I'm are your husband us. and my husband is you. <laughs> yeah. So we have different things that kind of motivate us. There's a reason I prefer baking because baking feels a little more like assembly. Yeah. Whereas cooking, you have to be kind of always on baking. You can kind of pace out. You can slow your steps down a little bit more easily. But yeah, it's like anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour. It kind of depends on the recipe. So when you talk about meal planning, my thought was, oh, she's going to talk about, you know, one of these programs, which, oh my gosh, talk about overwhelming. Have you (laughs) ever been on and to see what I'm talking about where, you know, you go in and there's all these spreadsheets and what you're going to buy and then what you're going to make on this day and that. And I'm thinking, who the heck can follow that? No, no, I've never done one of those. I can't imagine doing one of those. I think my thing with meal planning is like, if you haven't found a system that works, if you've tried to use someone else's system and it hasn't worked for you, that doesn't mean that you're bad at meal planning. It just means it's not the system for your brain. My system works really well for my brain. We started off with a whiteboard. The whiteboard like didn't have enough. We needed a grocery list with it we've finally found the right meal planning pads for it. It works for us. But if if my system doesn't work for you, it's about figuring out what your goal is. Like, what is your goal with meal planning? Is it to not have to make a decision at dinner time? Is it to try new ingredients? Is it that you want to cook more original recipes? Is it that you want to maximize leftovers? What is that goal? And then figure out kind of working back from there, what helps you get there? So let me ask you a question. I'm sure there's someone listening Mm -hmm. who's thinking, I hate cooking. I just want to get my kids fed with something Mm -hmm. that's nutritious. I don't want to do any of this. What would be your recommendation? Well, okay. I would say the first thing you need to do is figure out if there's anything other than the food itself that might motivate you in the kitchen. For example, I know I don't always enjoy cooking by myself, especially if I can hear other people having fun or doing something else in another room. But I love cooking with other people. So if you're making a simple dinner for your kids, is there a way that your kids can be involved in making it? I know like I don't have kids. People who do might think that sounds bananas to include them, but there might be a way to include them in the dinner, to invite them in, to ask them what they want to eat when you're doing your meal plan, and then to ask them help make it. There's a lot of kids safe kitchen equipment out there that might, you know, by having other people in the kitchen with you, make cooking less of a boring chore and more something fun that you're all doing. And I mean, of course, like if your answer is just no, you don't like cooking, you don't want to get your kids involved in making a mess. You just want it to be something that you can get done quickly. I totally get that too. I would say look for things like sheet pan dinners where you kind of just put everything on one sheet pan. Yeah. Use the same things over and over again. Like we kind of do, it's like, all right, we're having chicken one night. We might do burgers the next night, maybe tacos the next night, but we're going to have broccoli as a side with every single one of those. Cause we're mm. just going to buy a bunch of broccoli and on night one, we're going to chop it all up. We're going to roast what we need for dinner that night. And the rest of it will go in the fridge. We'll use it again tomorrow. So anything that we can like keep simple, it doesn't have to be complicated. You can make a really good meal with just salt, pepper, and olive oil. You don't need a ton of spices and make this marinade and do this in advance and all this stuff. Figure out what your important thing is. And if your important thing is, I need recipes that I can get on the table fast for my kids Look for things like sheet pan meals, use frozen components. Frozen vegetables are like great. They stay good for a really long time. They're just as nutritious as fresh ones. Look for things that are hands off and don't be afraid to use prepared stuff. Rotisserie chickens are something we use all the time when we're like, oh, we, we need like a protein for this, but we don't really feel like cooking chicken tonight or we forgot to defrost the chicken. My husband will just pick up a rotisserie chicken on his way home from work and now we have our chicken. So don't be afraid of doing those sorts of things. I'm also a big fan of working for like one pan pastas. You know, anything I can do to reduce the amount of dishes I have to wash are really helpful. But yeah, I mean, I think keeping it simple and, you know, do stuff that matches your energy level just because it it's faster or more convenient or doesn't use some unique ingredient, doesn't make it any less nutritious or 
fulfilling or, you know, good for what you need. Yeah. I've said for decades, if you give me an onion, some bacon, olive oil, mm-hmm. and maybe balsamic glaze, I can make anything. Mm-hmm. Good. And salt and pepper. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. really, it's not that hard. I, I completely mm-hmm. agree with you. And I almost think that when there's so many ingredients, then to me, it just doesn't even taste good. But yeah. where you're going, when you're trying yeah. it. Yeah. And um, I think also, you know, using things like, like, uh, like a mini food processor, there's uh-huh. some nights where I'm like, all right, I'm going to chop the onion by hand. I'm going to chop the celery by hand. I'm going to chop the carrot by hand. And there's other nights where I just put them all in a food processor. And I'm like, eh, it's good enough. It's going to get it done faster. And that's what I need right now. And those kind of short- shortcuts are totally fine. You can buy pre-chopped carrot, onion, and celery. There is no shame in that. Yeah, if that I helps you get goes. cooking faster, do it. So you have, <laughs> I just uh, bought the uh, ice cream attachment for mm-hmm. my chocolate made. Mm-hmm. And I saw on your website a recipe for chocolate rosemary ice cream. Mm-hmm. Is that really worth making? I mean, I think it is. I love <laughs> chocolate and rosemary together. I have a, a chocolate chip rosemary loaf cake on there. I think I have something else, chocolate and rosemary too. I think it's really delicious. I used to, the, the only thing with ice cream that I find tricky is you have to remember to freeze the bowl like the night before. And of course, well, and with that one, <laughs> you have to freeze the bowl like 24 hours in yeah. advance. So it's, yeah, it's not, but I've been so frustrated. You know, I had one really good ice cream machine 20 mm-hmm. years ago. And ever since then, everything that I've tried, it just doesn't freeze the ice cream. So I thought, well, mm-hmm. so I don't have one more ice cream machine. You know, I figured I'll just buy the attachment. And mm-hmm. I saw that recipe and I was planning on doing it the weekend. So I am going to try it and I'm going to yes. it back. I yeah, the thing I the thing I will say cheese. about um, ice cream recipes is you can ch- so you sh- you should chill the ice cream base before like the the yeah. lemon glaze yeah chill that as well before churning it so okay. if you put if you make it twenty four hours before you plan to churn it you can put it in the fridge and the freezer bowl in the freezer and then twenty four ah. hours later make it rather than like chilling the bowl. And then the next day you're making the base and then you still have to chill the base. And then it's now 48 hours before you make the ice yeah. cream. Yeah. No, yeah. that's really, that I had never, well, I've never done that. So I, I'm mm-hmm. going to try it. So I want to know, Rebecca, mm-hmm. what is it about you and your ADHD that makes you so good at, um, I don't know, being a food blogger? I think I'm really good at multitasking. I'm really good at being able to do things quickly to the best of my ability and then move on to the next thing that needs to get done. You know, I I, occasionally I kind of spiral into a thing and I'm like, I need to do this perfectly. But ultimately, I get overwhelmed and then I go, you know what, I'm just going to do my best and I'm going to move on to the next thing and not worry about it too much. And I might have to clean something up later, but I'm going to move on. Um, And so I think that sort of drive to kind of just keep moving has been really helpful, especially as a food blogger. I'm the CEO. I do marketing. I'm my website manager. I do social and content and recipe and photos and have to do contracts. So the ability to just kind of keep moving and keep, you know, kind of going to the next thing and doing it to the best of my ability and moving on has been really helpful. And I think, I mean, in general, I think one of the things that has helped me be successful is that like in a crisis situation, I get very calm and very focused um, and can really kind of get myself out of it, which it worked. That was very great, good for breaking news in particular, but has also been helpful with like kitchen stuff. Um, and then ultimately, I think with ADD, the hyper-focusing and, and the being really passionate about the things that you care about, I mean the amount of work that goes into a food blog, I I don't know that I could have sustained it without my ADD Mm -hmm. kind of really, really driving me to learn more and to do more and, and to just be excited about it, even when it's really hard. Do you have a number one ADHD workaround? I mean, I think the Alexa Mm -hmm. using my, sorry, A-L-E-X-A is definitely a big one. But I think the biggest thing for me is just figuring out what works for my brain and then doing it even if it seems weird. 
you know, my kitchen isn't organized the way other people's kitchens might be organized. I know when my parents come to visit, they're like, you have so much stuff out. And I'm like, yeah, because if I put it away, I forget it exists. And so just kind of figuring out, like, if I keep misplacing something, asking myself, well, where do you keep putting it when you misplace it? And then just making that the place where it belongs is one of the most useful things for me. It's one of my biggest ADHD workarounds is just going, I'm going to work around it by working with it. Do you struggle with the clutter at all? I do a little bit. I definitely have a lot of stuff. I try to keep it organized as best I can. The way my husband and I kind of describe it is our apartment is always like 30 minutes away from being ready for guests. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like 30 minutes of frantic cleaning and it'll look really organized. But for the most part, when it's just the two of us, if like the kitchen island's covered in stuff and there's stuff all over the coffee table or, you know, there's like socks in the middle of the hallway for some reason, it doesn't super bother us. We do have one of the things that helps, though, is we have a Roomba and the Roomba runs twice a week on a schedule. And when we hear that Roomba click on. It's like, oh, God, we got to pick everything up off the floor. That is hilarious. That is a fantastic workaround. So the Roomba is basically, it's an announcement that, hey, guys, get to it. Oh, I love it. And so all of a sudden we have to run around and pick everything up. And it sort of (laughs) creates this like frantic 15 minutes of cleaning, you know, that we wouldn't have otherwise. So (laughs) there is some clutter, but it's generally we know where things are. And then periodically we we organize because we have guests coming over or the Roomba is going to eat them if we don't move them. (laughs) So are, are you worried? I've I've been, I'm sitting here, you know, like, should I tell this story, which I may have told before. Mm -hmm. So when I first got the Roomba, our dog was a puppy. Oh, I think I know where this is going. I don't remember what happened, but Mm -hmm. I just remember coming home one day and there was literally crap stuck all yeah. in the Roomba because she had, you know, gone to the bathroom, mm-hmm. had an accident, poop. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, it doesn't just go over at once. No, it goes over it back yep. and then it goes forward and then it goes back. Mm-hmm. It took me, I think, an hour just to pull all the pieces oh and my you know, God. clean it all out. So every time I hear about the Roomba, that's what I think about. But so I, I love that, that workaround. That happened to my in-laws. And I did hear <laughs> the newer models of Roomba apparently have a poop detector. <laughs> The d- the problem is it can't sense diarrhea. Oh, geez. Yeah. It can only sense solid, <laughs> solid waste. Oh, my <laughs> yeah, God. We have cats. They use litter boxes. So it's not a huge problem. But we do. The Roomba is on a schedule. One of the times when it goes is at like 1030 at night on a Wednesday because we know we'll be home. Yeah. We don't want it to run if we're not here. So we had to put it at times when we're like, we'll probably be here at those times. So it does mean like our cleaning time is now 1030 on a Wednesday. So the Roomba really works because my, you know, I still have it sitting there, but I never use it anymore because it was always getting stuck. Ours, I mean, we have a small apartment that's one floor. We do close the bathroom doors because it will just go in the bathroom and clean the bathroom for an hour if you (laughs) let it. It's not the smartest. But it does, with the two cats, we have a ton of cat hair everywhere. And with all of the cooking and stuff and the flour and the mm-hmm. everything, like, we're good at putting stuff away in the kitchen, but cleaning stuff up, you know, sweeping, vacuuming, we're not always the best at. And so knowing that the Roomba is going to go around the bottom of the cabinets in the kitchen and get like, you know, the garlic papers that fell under yeah. there or whatever is really helpful. We do vacuum and, you know, Swiffer in addition to that occasionally, but knowing that the Roomba is going to run twice a week and just get the like hairballs and, and those sorts of things does, it does make a difference. And there's one, I understand now that I don't know how often you have to clean the, you know, I mean, it literally like it goes right into a garbage can and unloads yes. it. So you don't Yeah, have- I've seen that one. Because that, to me, it's like it was more work for me to clean it Mm -hmm. (laughs) than um, to just go and do it myself. So I I was interested. Anyway, Rebecca, are Mm -hmm. you working on something that you want to tell us about? I mean, currently I'm working primarily on my blog. You can follow it at thepracticalkitchen.com. I'm on Instagram at the.practical.kitchen and on Twitter at practicalkitch. 
you Mind can you. also find me on Facebook. I think I'm on some other social media platforms, but they're not as, <laughs> as prevalent. If you sign up for my newsletter, um, it goes out once a week and you'll kind of get updates on other things I'm working on. I just started teaching virtual baking classes. I don't have like a set schedule for them. I have one coming up later in July. If I don't know when this will go out, but I'm hoping to do at least one a month. So if anyone's interested in virtual baking classes, definitely subscribe to my newsletter because announcements will go out there. And they can do that at practical on, on my website. Yes. Practicalkitchen.com slash subscribe and you'll subscribe to my newsletter. Wonderful. So we'll have all of this in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Rebecca, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Of course. Thank you for having me. This was such a great conversation. My pleasure. It was. So that's what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Rebecca, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation. ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.